Hello class, this is lecture 2-4 from the Forrester textbook, and I have a weird question that I want to ask you. So if you have a thought about this, write it down. We'll talk about it in class. You'll probably forget if you don't write it down, so write it down. My weird question for you is, has there ever been anything, either amongst your friends or in your family, that has just a weird thing has happened often enough that you have a name for it. So I'll, I'll tell you about my one here. So my daughter is little, and she used to be littler, and when she was uh, real young, maybe three, she would just mispronounce all the words. And the word that she just massacred the most, well, she massacred a lot of words, but one word she massacred was mustache. And she would always pronounce it as nuspash. And when you're drinking milk, which we make them all try to drink milk, be healthy, and you're drinking milk and you get a milk mustache, she would, that would be the only time we'd ever have reason to talk about mustaches, she would always refer to that as a nuspash. And so now, as we've moved on and she can actually say mustache, we kept referring to having a milk mustache, a food beard, as a nuspash. So that's still a vocab word in our house is that, oh, you got a nuspash. patch, is that it refers to this weird thing that just happens at the dinner table with kids is you get the ring around the mouth. So do you have anything like that? Is there something weird that happens often enough that you have a name for? <laughs> So we've been talking about trig functions. There's these different ratios to the side of a triangle. There's when you talk about the y compared to the hypotenuse to the radius, that is sine. When you talk about x compared to the radius, that's cosine. When you talk about y compared to x, that's tangent. Well, just like you might have a word for something weird in your family or circle of friends because it happens often enough, in trig we need to talk about all the different ratios because they actually do come up often enough that they bear getting their own names. So the first weird one is instead of talking about y divided by x, we talk about x divided by y. And that's called cotangent. Let me write that down. Cotangent. It's just the regular old word tangent that you're used to with a co put in the front. So that's pretty easy. There's tangent. The flip of tangent uh, is cotangent. But then there's a word that maybe you heard in geometry, maybe not, but it is called secant, S-E-C-A-N-T. And this is where we're going to say radius divided by x. So this is a new one that you may or may not have heard of but it is, like all trig functions, a ratio of two sides of a right triangle. And lastly, of course, if you haven't heard of secant, you definitely have never heard of cosecant. Co, oops, cosecant. And these have abbreviations, cot, sec, and cosc. There, so these ratios are important parts of talking about the pieces of uh, a circle. But one of the things to notice is that these really aren't s total new creations. They're all reciprocals of trig functions that we've already talked about. So we just said that tangent and cotangent are reciprocals of each other. So that's pretty easy to remember. And then you can see here if cosine is x over r, and secant is r over x, then cosine and secant are just reciprocals of each other. Lastly, I laid it out here in a cool uh, pattern, sine and cosecant are also reciprocals of each other. y over r, r over y, it goes back and forth. I have to have little memory tricks to help me remember this sort of stuff, is that you can think about the three trig functions that you already knew, sine, cosine, and tangent. One of them already had the word, the prefix co, that started it out, cosine. So any of these trig functions that have co in their name are going to flip over to ones without co in their name, and the ones without co flip to having co. So sine flips to cosecant, co 
cosine flips to secant, tangent flips to cotangent, and vice versa. So they're pretty easy to keep track of if you write them out in this kind of uh, menorah pattern, or if you remember that trick, co flips to not co, stuff like that. So that's hopefully something that's not too difficult to remember. Try to keep that straight. Now, these pieces of the triangle, not only do they have sort of algebraic definitions where we say this is equal to x over r or r over x, they also have geometric definitions. Now, this is something that if you're taking notes, you should write down in your notes, but don't freak out about like trying to memorize this. We will revisit this again. This is just something to sort of say, I, I like pictures, Smurf, where are the pictures? I don't just want to see the algebra, draw me a picture of what you're talking about. What is a secant? What is a tangent? So if you think of a circle here, <clears throat> I should probably just go with the fancy diagram that they have there, that sine and cosine and one, the, the radius, all take place in this little triangle right here. If you extend that triangle out, a similar triangle that then instead of just having a radius of one, goes out all the way until it meets the tangent line, then that uh, hypotenuse of that triangle will be, or the reference triangle, will be secant, the value of secant, one over the cosine. If you, again, extend that triangle out until it goes all the way out till the bottom, till the x is equal to 1, then the y value will be tangent. So that's just where these come from. Tangent means that it touches something at only one point. That if you have a circle, then the line tangent to it touches it at just one point, and that's it. Secant means it cuts through to the tangent. All the ones with co in their name can be thought of as a triangle that instead of extending to the tangent line off to the right, it extends to the cotangent line up to the top. So a cotangent, everything with co in the name refers to the, the 90, that the, the cotangent is the one that just barely grazes it at the top at one point, and the cosecant is the extension of that triangle, the extension of the hypotenuse that goes out and meets it there. Again, you don't need to memorize this. You don't need to have this all perfect in your mind. I want to show it to you one time. We'll come back to it again, and we'll get it set up in our own minds completely in the future. For now, I just want you to know that this secant, cosecant, cotangent, that these actually have geometric definitions. We'll worry about you being able to reproduce them later. So now you say, OK, that's great. Those exist. How can I do those for any given angle? I don't have any button on my calculator for cosecant or t cotangent or secant. I just have sine and cosine and tangent buttons. How am I supposed to do these? Well, as we said, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So if you want to find secant of 60 degrees, it's just going to be 1 over cosine of 60. Cosine of 60 is a half. You flip that over, you get 2. So in your calculator, you can practice this. Type 1 divided by cos 60, and you should get 2. If we wanted to find cotangent of 45, that's not a button that we have on the calculator, but we do have a tangent button. So 1 over tangent 45 is the same as cotangent of 45. That's 1. Last one, we've talked about these three new trig functions here. If you want to find cosecant of 135, which trig function are you going to use? Who's, what's it the reciprocal of? It's the reciprocal of sine. So you're going to say 1 over sine 135, which is uh, one over uh, one over root two, which is root two. So, take a second here. Let's make sure that you understand what's going on here. We've already done this before on the last lesson, where we figured out through some point there's an angle that goes through some point, and that let us then find the three trig functions we knew then that go through that point that use that point as pieces of a reference triangle. Now, here's another point. Negative 3, negative 4, there's a reference triangle that goes through that angle, that goes through that point. 
you should pause the video and find the six trig functions that go through that point. All right, we are back and we are trying to find, hopefully you have found the six trig functions that go through the point negative three, negative four. Now, what's the hypotenuse of this one gonna be? I left the Pythagoras drawing up on the slide for you. It must be five. So if we look at this and we say, what is sine of this angle? Well, it's opposite over hypotenuse, negative four fifths. What is the uh, cosine? Well, it is adjacent over hypotenuse. And what is the tangent? It's opposite over adjacent, which reduces. Now, all you have to do is take those three easy ones and flip them over to get the three other ones. They're all just reciprocals. So cotangent is going to be the flip of that. And then uh, secant is going to be the flip of that and cosecant will be the flip of that. And if you wrote those as decimals, that's certainly okay. If you didn't get that, make a note there and we'll talk about it in class. We'll ask me and we can go over that again. Make sure that you're able to find all six trig functions that go through a given point, including the correct sign. Now, as we try to move to being able to do some of these without a calculator, we're going to need to know some triangles that we can know everything about. Are there any triangles that we can know all the sides and all the angles, which would let us then be able to find all the trig functions for those angles? Well, there are two such ones that are really easy. There's more than that, but they get quite complicated doing pentagons and stuff. But the easy ones are you take a square and you cut it in half or you take an equilateral triangle and you cut it in half. You can see here from the drawing that if you cut a square with sides of one into half diagonal, you have to cut it the diagonal way, not into rectangles, but into triangles, of course, then the hypotenuse will have a length of root two. You've got 45, 45, 90 triangles with sides of one, one, and hypotenuse of root two. So that's going to be super easy. And if we redraw it so that it's got a uh, hypotenuse of one, that means we've taken a square and we've wanted to have a hypotenuse of one, then we've got a right triangle over here that needs to have a hypotenuse of one. We want c squared equals a squared plus b squared. We want c to be one, and we want a and b to be the same as each other. We want them to be uh, equivalent. So that means that we've got one half equals a squared, a equals one over root two. Spruce that up a little bit, and we get root two over two. If we draw this triangle now with sides of 1 and root 2 over 2 and root 2 over 2, and this is 45, then we can use that now to say what is sine of 45. If we look in, at the opposite over uh, the hypotenuse, that's opposite over hypotenuse. Anything over 1 is itself, so skip that. And then again, we're going to have the same thing when we try to take cosine. It's adjacent over hypotenuse, which is that same number. And then tangent of 45 is opposite over adjacent. Root 2 over 2 divided by root 2 over 2 sounds like a nightmare, but anything divided by itself is 1. So that's a very helpful triangle for us to know and be able to get all those values. If we take a equilateral triangle, and cut it up, then let's, let's start off with one. Let's do an easy one that's got sides of two. Sides of two, and therefore all the angles are 60. If we cut it in half, if we draw an altitude right down here and make 60 degree stuff, well, we just split this side in half. We just split these sides of two in half, so that's one. And we just split these angles of 60 in half, so that's 30 degrees in there. 
Well, now, what is going to be the size of this altitude? Well, we've got 2 squared equals 1 squared plus uh, whatever we're looking for squared. So that's 4 minus 1 equals x squared. x equals root 3. If we redraw this now in a most useful way, so we're talking about the unit circle, if we redraw it with a hypotenuse of 1, we can see that's just an easy matter of dividing everything by 2. Make that 1, make that half, make that root 3 over 2, and now we can see all the pieces that way. So if we want to find out what is sine of 30, then sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so that's 1 half over 1, or just 1 half. If we want to find a tangent of, let's do 60, tangent of 60 is going to be root 3 over 2 divided by 1 half, which simplifies to root 3. So using this, we can find all of the trig functions, all six of the trig functions, for 30, 45, 60. And because of reference triangles, we can use that for the entire unit circle. So uh, that is the, uh, the table that you can see here. This is a shortcut here. I'm not going to let you uh, just copy this down. You need to make your own. Your homework is to make a great big drawing of the unit circle and to find all six trig functions for all, boy, how many spots are there here? So there's going to be 3 per quadrant, 12 plus 4 is 16. So there are 16 places that you need to have six blanks for. So right here at uh, 0, which is the same as 360, and at 30, and at 45, and at 60, and at 90, and at 120, and 135, and 150, and 180, you get the idea. You need to tell me all six trig functions for all 16 angles. Don't work too hard. Everything is just a plus or minus version of the stuff in the first quadrant. Find the first quadrant ones and then just copy them around, flipping them left and right, up and down, making negative versions. If you have any questions, I'll see you in class.